Welcome to the One Life Maps podcast. Here's your host and co-author of Listen to My Life, maps for recognizing and responding to God in my story, Sharon Swing. Greetings, this is Sharon Swing. We're so glad you've chosen to come back and listen to the One Life Maps podcast. We've been on a little break and a good sabbatical over Christmas and through January. And so this is our first podcast back. And around the table today, I have with me Joan Kelly, our Director of Facilitator Development for One Life Maps. Hello, everybody. And Sybil Towner. Sybil Towner is the co-author of Listen to My Life, and uh, she spends most of her time down at the Springs of Indiana, which is a retreat center. But she's in the Chicagoland area today and uh, sitting around the table with us. She's going to be teaching tonight, and she's going to be talking about spiritual formation. And a lot of ideas out of the book, Invitation to a Journey by Robert Mulholland. So thanks. I'm so glad you're here today. And I am so glad I'm here, too. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. So... Sybil's going to lead us into this conversation, and we're going to start out with talking a little bit about um, a definition of spiritual formation. What is it? Hmm. Well, it's uh, one that uh, Robert Mulholland really has helped many of us who have been seeking to understand it say it, but he just simply said, it is the process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of of others. And some of us have added the phrase to the glory of God. But really that essential one, a process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. And so that is a simple definition. And um, in his book, Invitation to a Journey, um, Bob opens it up and really defines process, being conformed, the image of Christ, and for the sake of others. And I think it'd be great to just have a little conversation about how that has worked in each of us. Uh, Because um, knowing one another, we have all been in Mm -hmm. a process. Right, for sure. And uh, and In the thick of it together (laughs) in many ways, yes. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, But we live in a peculiar and particular culture that is so focused, and I think even in our church cultures, in our church cultures, we're counting how much money did we bring in, we're counting how many seats did we fill, Mm -hmm. how many people are in small groups. And so we generally come to expect an immediate return on our investment of time and resources. So if we do this series in a church, this will happen. It's an if this, then that kind of an equation. Yes. Right? Yes. And um, the three of us would say, that is not how our lives have unfolded. There's more to the journey, right? (laughs) Right. And when you discover there's something interiorly going on (laughs) versus this kind of what you described, so it felt very exterior, external. And so one of the things that happened to me way early in life, I came across, well, one, I began to read missionary stories because I was unimpressed with people who were writing kind of right in the middle of their journeys in America about their churches or their ministries. But I read missionaries who were long gone um, and who had stood the test of time. I I was reading Corrie Ten Boom. She was still Mm -hmm. alive, but at that time. And, but another one I read was Granny Brand and Granny Brand, uh, what she and her husband went to India and it was in this series of time where we we were really trying to uh, evangelize, trying to get people to come to Christ. And maybe it was because I, I, I wasn't the kind of person who went and confronted people uh, or asked them four questions. And so I was wrestling with maybe what was the matter with me. And and I read Granny and, and uh, her story, and they moved into a place in India and farmed and lived among the people. And it was 20 years before they experienced their first convert. Hmm. But another part of the story is their son, um, Paul Brand, lived there and he was exposed to leprosy. He became an orthopedic surgeon who could have gone anywhere in the United States, Stanford, Boston, and that 
but his heart was to work with lepers. And, uh, and out of his story, then uh, Philip Yancey, who had been so um, wounded by his experience of growing up in Christ, just sort of wrote disappointment with God and where is God when it hurts? And, uh, and then he met Philip Yancey. And his Christianity, his life in Christ was restored. Are you saying Philip Yancey met Paul Brand? Paul Brand, Brand yes. Okay. Yeah. And and so they co-authored a book called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. And that book has now just come out in a new title. So I just look at the outlived life of this family that went and planted themselves, called by God, to love a process. What do you think? I mean, any place where you have noted um, a process? I think, I think for me, Sybil, as you're talking, as I look back now, I can see there was a process in place. And there was certainly a time when I realized there was a process in place, but no one had ever told me before. And certainly Listen to My Life had a, a piece of that. And things like The Critical Journey had a piece like because And then you start reading some of these books. And you're like, wait, there are other people on this journey. And it, it has a way about it. But it's, as you said, I mean, it's slow. And it's a, a trickle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, think about it in the natural order. Think about it with a child. You know, there's a process. Mm -hmm. Children... Who, crawl, who do not crawl before they walk, miss something. There's something about crawling that develops in a child that leads to walking. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, um, there are processes that are, we don't buy the processes, they're mm -hmm. just already built in. Mm -hmm. I think for me, you know, I grew up in a, in a denomination that believed you know they they did infant baptism because of the of the fact that they have a really high view of the sacraments and that you're saved because you were baptized and so evangelism was not a part of the storyline um and i walked away from the church when i was in college not because i was rebelling but because it was just kind of irrelevant. What's the point? Yeah, it was it was a once a point. So nobody around me was going to find a church when I arrived at college. So I didn't either, and um, it just never occurred to me actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and so there was a there's a picture. But then I landed in a part in my story in an evangelical church, which was all about sharing the story and getting people to cross the line of faith as if and and the story was told at least the way I processed it was no it's not like baptism like they told me the story the first time and then they then I heard the new story basically that it's this moment in time when everything's taken care of and it's done and then figuring out along the way um it it's it yet works different than that when I started hearing about spiritual formation kind of things, but that's not exactly how the church organized the thought processes. Yes. And then once I actually started reading some of the spiritual formation books and this invitation to a journey was one of the early ones for me, um, I started realizing that regardless of what the church structures are or what the, in the, what the particular, um, denominations, um, theological perspective is this process of spiritual formation is happening with or without any of that <laughs> yes <laughs> you know church strategy is quite irrelevant to god's forming us yes. as people in our mm -hmm. souls regardless of of even if we're aware that god exists so and he's doing the work he's doing, he's doing the, the forming right. and we yes. are yeah it, it, being it, formed it, it, exactly and it's it's um Life presents mm -hmm. spiritual formation opportunities. We always have an opportunity to work so in the he's direction in, of the spirit yeah, or not. Right. right. And he's inviting. It's are we walking towards? Are we noticing? Are yes. we aware? Exactly. Well, <clears throat> you talked a little bit about the hazelnut. Uh-huh. And uh, I mean, just 
explain picture. that a little bit. I so well, that no was last night at about. dinner. Yes. You weren't. Well, <laughs> <laughs> these ladies, no, and men were not here. <laughs> At the big well, table. Let's, yeah, we, I'm not going to go <laughs> quite there, but, but just think of a hazelnut yeah. holding it in your hand. Think of what it can become. Mm-hmm. I mean, just hold it. Put in the ground, having rain and sun and wind and change of weather, something spurts up Mm -hmm. and again the seasons and time and this thing grows isn't that fascinating that god puts his process of formation right in front of us every single day everywhere in (laughs) our children in a seed that's planted Mm -hmm. well just read um uh, psalm 84 verse 5 it says um Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Yeah. Gordon MacDonald writes this. He said, to give us the spiritual gift we desire, God may have to begin far back in our spirit. So think of that going back to the beginning when he, he, we were just a thought in his mind and heart before we were ever conceived, in regions unknown to us and do much work that we can only be aware of in the results. And so what what do you think? What's making... Well, that we can only be aware of in the results. Yes. Yeah, I mean... It, I like it's... to draw or, you know, I, I like to sing. I love going out and planting in the dirt. And you just realize this is a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Francois Fenelon said this, Fenelon, God hides his work in the spiritual order as in the natural order in the unnoticeable sequence of Mm -hmm. events. Yeah, that's what we just talked about, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, I just thought, and and one of the things I thought about, it's an old movie, Karate Kid. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's really old now. (laughs) We're not old. The movie's old. No, the, the, yeah, that. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you you remember wax on, wax off. But uh-huh. all the processes. This kid was under the older gentleman was taught. He had no idea that they would come together mm-hmm. into something that would be meaningful. Okay, so for those yeah. people who are under fifty. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's just kind of a retro kid. classic. It's movie. a retro classic movie, but basically the 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 karate master is is giving this kid all kinds of tasks that wants to learn how to do karate. He wants to be a, a karate champion fighter. You know, he wants to defend himself. He's kind of a he's a wimp in the he's... in the story that wants to become a strong person. And instead of teaching the kid karate, he teaches him how to <laughs> how to polish a fence and put the wax on with 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 one hand and take it off with the other in these circular motions which end up being moves that he's going to need later on but the kid is absolutely frustrated because the guy's the the, the karate instructor's house is getting all all dolled up and mm-hmm. looking pretty good <laughs> and and, 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 he's, and the kid feels like he's just being used for cheap labor and uh, little does he understand that that this is what's going to make him successful and being able to, of course, at the penultimate moment of the of the movie, um, emerge triumphant mm-hmm. in the fight of his life. Yeah. And so, in 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 that sense, we could even say, in the process, there isn't anything in our lives that God can't use, and even the very hard things. And then, a part of our journey in life is actually at the right time peeling back. Oh, you were there too. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things. I just received um, an email last night. I don't know if you two have had a chance to read it from Linda Hainer. And mm-hmm. Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. That, she, that she attached, which are the um, the reviews or comments, I should say, that the, the women at uh, the Shakopee Prison who have gone through prison fellowships, um, Prison Fellowship Academy, and been a part of, as they call it, the MAPS class. They use Listen to My Life and take people through the entire process. And part of the of the comments of the, in the questions that they're asked is 
you know, what effect has this had on, on you, this life story work? And so many of the comments were, I, th- I never even considered the idea that God was with me. I mean, my, my, my background is, is so horrific and, mm-hmm. and horrible. And now I see that God was with me the whole time. Wow. And I see how God has been working mm. over time. Mm. Yeah. And that he's here now with me in the midst of this incarceration, you know, and, and, and he's taking me somewhere. Wow. And so the encouragement that that realization brings and the hope that mm-hmm. wells up because of it not only helps some, some of these women endure incarceration not just endure it but actually thrive in the midst of it like and when I went to go visit that program and I've told the story before to be s- sitting across from somebody who says I am so grateful I got to come here meaning to prison <laughs> yeah you know because of the fact that now I understand my who I am she as found a, herself as mm-hmm. as a daughter Mm-hmm. of the most high king yeah. god and i understand he's been with me all the time and now i have a, a sense of how to how to move with him into the future and it i mean to be grateful for being incarcerated even mm-hmm. um and seeing it. she couldn't maybe name it this way but she was being grateful for the opportunity to be spiritually formed by that difficult experience. Yeah, she was transformed. Yeah. I mean, that's true redemption right there. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. yeah, the definition. Yeah. So she entered into the process and uh, was in a place where something opened up to her. And got totally surprised by it, right? Yes, <laughs> totally. Which is how it works. Um, and And just before we move on to just say this so this process so rubs against the instant gratification of our culture of the world yeah yeah and uh, so and just the world that we live in today so then in this process what is happening we are being conformed um, we are being conformed, and again, to say it again, spiritual formation is the process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. Um, for us to become, in this being conformed, to become people who have compassion, calm meaning with and passion suffering, to being with suffering, which is really a part of what you described, people who forgive, people who care deeply for each other and the world. So this being conformed is moving away from being self-referenced, from being the word that is used in our culture today uh, um, is describing us that we are a narcissistic culture, that it's really all about me and who offer themselves to God to become agents of the divine grace in the lives of others. And I like this statement, in their world. It's not over someplace else thousands of miles. It's in their neighborhood, in their community. In my circle of influence, the people I rub up against every day. Yeah, that is the place where it works. And I just... I always love the story of the woman who poured the ointment on Jesus. Mm-hmm. She, in her world, <laughs> did an act of what we've just described yeah, here. love. An act of compassion, of love, toward one who had spoken life to her. And his words to her, this, this story will be told around the world. So she operated in her world in her time, Mm. and God took care of its delivery. Mm. Yeah. Um, But a part of the, a part of the work in this being conformed is that we, the issue here is control. And that starts very early. It, It actually starts about 18 months. And the first time we issue it forth, we say, no. No. And we begin to figure out how we can control our world. Mm -hmm. And we all 
those of us here and those listening, we figured out we're actually all pretty smart how to survive in the worlds in which we grew up. And we, each of us, created some form of emergency solutions to take care of ourselves. And, uh, uh, and then what happens is those emergency solutions become us. It's, it's, it's the only way we know ourselves. Mm. What, do you, what does that make you think of? I mean, it just feels like a mask or a, a covering, a laminate, you know, that we put on top of ourselves to protect us from the world, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there are a number of ways that, uh, you know, that we do this. Um, uh, Thomas Keating talks about our um, emotional programs for happiness. Mm. You know, what we either try to power up and control, really high control wherever we are, or we spend time trying to um, uh, get affirmation and approval to be okay, or we try to create ways of staying safe and secure. I mean, any of those pop into you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, How about all of them? I mean, <laughs> well, they all. How much do. time do you have? I, I, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't want this podcast to last two hours, so I'll, I'll just say, uh huh. <laughs> Yeah, but um, I mean, but, think about it. It's nine thirty. I've probably already <laughs> done all of those. <laughs> yeah, but we we each actually have kind of a a default place. Yeah, and um, you know, and I think for me, um, I really wanted people to like me. You know, I didn't want to be. I I I felt my. I would say if I had to name sort of a childhood wound a place of of loss and uh and it was just the circumstances of life somebody didn't do something to me and that but I just didn't feel like I belonged so I worked really hard to try to belong in a group and uh, and what I found what was my early experience as a five-year-old is when I went with somebody, my grandmother took me to a church and I felt like I belonged. And all of my life, I've, I've been drawn to some form of church. Mm-hmm. Then it was a building and the people in the building. So um, today, it can be two or three gathered together who um, call themselves ones who are seeking to follow Christ. So it, it, church has a different um definition but any of those strike you or or um a story that comes forward i i think for me it's it is also affirmation and approval and that as I'm, I'm thinking back to more childhood of people pleasing and you know grew up in a home where um dad suffered from some pretty severe mental illness i was the last child by far and there you know, a lot of argument went on, and it was way. It was my way of keeping the peace. Yeah. So affirmation and approval for sure. Yeah, I think for me, um, in fact, some current circumstances that are kind of on the periphery are, are making me highly aware these days of the fact that the fact that I've got some pride in some pretty stupid things, um, <laughs> and. Uh, it just is just it, it's a very interesting process i i joined a league and and it it it's just one of those things that doesn't make sense how how the how the game works how the league works and uh and so i i keep playing incredibly well but then not not moving up in the rankings which just has really irritated the <laughs> bejeebers out of me it's like okay what difference does it make you we'll know, get you a trophy Sharon it'll no, be okay no trophy. There's no trophy. <laughs> but we'll get you one but the standings come out I'm, I'm a people bo- pleaser I, I'll I, get I, you I'm one. on the bottom of the list and I've, it, but but I've got like 89 percent of my in my my possible total you just points. have to turn it's the like, list upside down <laughs> exactly something like this but but 
so clearly there's been a mistake somewhere that hasn't been recognized and yet there's just or or the game just doesn't the, the league just doesn't make sense how it how it <laughs> operates or whatever but it's like why would I continue to participate in a game that has no rules and doesn't make any sense but then why does it matter to me <laughs> at all it's for fun oh well, it's supposed to be fun and here it is digging into my oh here I am face to face with my pride issue <laughs> You know? so, so the issue of control is a crucial part of our pilgrimage, of the much. spiritual pilgrimage. And that's um, that. And so getting my control structure out of the way and letting God take control. And, and some of us have to have something really big happen to us. And some of us, it's just small things over an extended period of time. And, uh, but that is, uh, that is a big key and a big key in this aspect of being conformed and where our life story takes work. And I think, um, Joan, when you shared your story or you've shared, sharing your story, this really came up to you is awareness. Mm-hmm. And since, uh, since we just said that this aspect of of creating emergency solutions or ways of survival are embedded early on. And then they just go underground and they become who we are. And when we become, again, developmentally old enough to begin to reflect back and to begin to say and be observant, why did I do that every time this happened? Or why did I go there to stay safe? Or, Mm -hmm. I I mean, just, and so, so, and another word we've used is we become curious. Yeah, becoming curious and aware versus judging ourselves and judging our reactions to things. But to do that, you have to slow down. Mm -hmm. Anybody we've talked with about this work of Listen to My Life, they're normally at a crossroads, but they're also going fast. Mm-hmm. And they take a look at the maps, and they, I don't think I have time. Mm-hmm. And you don't not have time right. to do this work at some point in your yeah. life, and to do it often. Yes. And what happened with the story you told of the woman who was incarcerated is she now had time and was actually maybe in a safer place inside than outside. In her story, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's a part of this work, and the work within our small groups or churches or friendship circles. Are there spaces that are created that are safe? Mm -hmm. And I think about this idea of slowing down that is so countercultural as we've seen and sometimes life uh, then if we don't make the time life circumstances create the time for us yes in illness or difficulty there's a loss of a job or you know how many people we know that that just push too hard and their bodies break Mm -hmm. in some way or whatever happens and there is this aspect of becoming aware of ourselves enough to realize that we're, we're pushing the limits, even though the world keeps telling us to, to push harder on that gas pedal. Yes. And this invitation to come away um, and the work Joan does with, uh, with Gail Donahue and, and Sacred, the, the solitude retreats, the one-day retreats, mylifeissacred.com if you want to find out mm-hmm. about that for sure. There's just this these ways of being that um, the church doesn't talk about a whole lot sometimes. Maybe they'll mention it from the front, but then they'll follow that up with, hey, we need volunteers in the children's ministry <laughs> and here, there, and the other place. And so, and that's a, that's a good way to get connected and involved, and those are good things. That's how a church operates. Church couldn't work without the volunteers. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but there, there are more invitations to do more than there are invitations to do less. So, right. so you, uh, so you point out that uh, that we're focused in on doing, mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And actually doing flows out of being. And and Henry Nouwen talks about, um, uh, he says, in our culture, you are what you do, you are how others know you, and you are by how much you have. And then he says, when you die, you stop doing. People, you know, may remember you and that, but the circle gets really small of those who remember you and your stuff. I mean, there is someone who tried to put a lot in his casket, you know, in being buried, but really, you know, it's, it's, of, it's of little use. So his question is, is there more to your life than that? And obviously he suggests that there is and you are beloved. So when you, when you think of that, here we are. Spiritual formation is the process of being formed or be, yeah, being formed in the, um, in the image of Christ for the sake of others. What in the world is this image of Christ? And one of the things that the three of us have talked about before that really leans into this um, is a question that really flows out of the Ignatian exercises. But when we get quiet enough, where did we come from? Where are we going? And how do we get there? And most of us try to figure out life from the time we were born to, till uh, sort of that date that's sort of way out there when we die. But, but the whole package of life is in, is in that enclosed space. But when we you know, take that picture and really enlarge it, that we came from the mind and heart of God, we're going to God, then it, it re-opens uh, up, how do we get there? And I think it says, then we need to know who God is. And we need to know how loved we are. And then we need to know the image of Christ if we read the Gospels. How did he love? And then, okay, what is our part? There's no one like us. What is our part on extending the reign of the kingdom of God? What does that, what does that make you think about? Well, for me, it, it, it brings up the question that um, I'll, I'll go back to the a, a different woman at that same prison visit at Shakopee um, described her first lingering question as, uh, can I endure this, meaning her incarceration, and then ending uh, with a lingering question after the process was over of going through Listen to My Life of how much good can I do today, or what good can I do today? And this idea that um, these questions that drive us we got to be really careful about the questions that drive us. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> got to mm -hmm. be really, really careful about those because most questions that people are asking as I, as I do coaching, they're not asking themselves questions that are producing any of the fruits of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Peace, patience, kindness, <laughs> you know, self-control. <laughs> they're, they're producing angst. They're producing a, um, a fixation on what's wrong instead of what's right. Yes. A, f uh, a lack of an ability to move forward with um, with receiving grace so that grace can be given. Yeah. Um, and if that isn't the ball game in this world today, we've got to be able to receive grace in order to be able to give it. And grace and peace is what we need to be exchanging. And there's very little of it going on right now that I can see in the news. Mm. Mm. And I mean, in relational discord, in different ways. I mean, it's just grace and peace. Please, yeah. Yeah. let's let's exchange more of that. Is is yes. where that takes mm -hmm. me. Yeah, yeah. Well, the call, uh, really, our work is to love. And I think of um, one of the things of going back and seeing being in the mind and heart of God. And I we won't um, unpack it at all. But uh, Psalm one thirty nine is a you know, is a, is a beautiful um, confession 
by David as to who he was and to Mm -hmm. who God is. And then what that meant for the way he lived life of saying, all right, you examine my heart. If there's any way in me that isn't moving in your direction or that's anxious, you lead me in the way everlasting. That is a being conformed. And and David was anointed. He, he didn't name Christ, but he held the spirit of Christ in him. Mm. Um, so, um, uh, so I think that... Um, uh, that what you say there, Joan, anything you would add to this? I think just as you were, you know, describing, you know, the, the kind of three key questions, Sybil, it, it, it came back to where we started, right? It's a process mm-hmm. and it's going on and it's my choosing to notice, my choosing to engage, my choosing to, and I mean with God and my choosing to be aware um, otherwise, I'd go down life. I, I mean, I just drew a little picture in there, a piece of paper. I go down life kind of in parallel paths. I mean, God's over here in the right lane and I'm in the left, but I'm never glancing over to see that he's there. Yeah. And will I notice and will I decide, I think I should get in that car, actually. <laughs> yeah. And um, so. And it's and it's an invitation. It's an invitation. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so when you think about this process of being conformed, so it's the work of Christ in you, and you have to become aware and notice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and it's really coming to believing in the goodness of God, that actually our primary work is love. And that's what Jesus spoke to, lived out, died for, came back to life for. I mean, it is as clear, as clear as it can be. And then that we have been given the Holy Spirit to live out the demands of love. This is this will cost us um, mm-hmm. in our life, and why? For the sake of others. There are many programs that have you delving into yourself, mm-hmm. looking at yourself, trying to become mindful of yourself, but it's so circular that you wind up getting stuck in these dark alleys and places of saying, well, what else is there in me and where else can I discover? No, rest in what you've discovered and share it out in the world for the sake of others. Your life counts in the life of the world. It is not self-referenced unto yourself. And that's, to me, that's part of the problem with some of the, some of the ways of being mindful that are being espoused today. They keep refocusing on me. And it just becomes a um, subtle narcissistic trip. No, this is for the sake of the world. This is for the sake of the world in which I live. So I, I, just, I just love that movement. And the way of that movement is engaging spiritual practices, silence and solitude, looking at scripture in a fresh way, looking at your story, the resource of Listen to My Life, I think is one that really engages that mindful awareness and connects you to God in a, in a way that um, just encourages you on your journey. Um, the practice of self-examination and the practice of, of discernment, those practices actually don't fix us, but they open us to invite God to do his work in and through us. And there's a statement, Sharon, that you that always rings from you. But the thing is, Christ wants to live in you. Through you. Through you. As you. As yes. you. And mm-hmm. this is the mm-hmm. process of unfolding that. Yeah. I think that, you know, looking back, because, I mean, really, it's 18 years since we wrote listen to my life since we developed it and um the conversations i remember around the table about what to title it and listen Mm -hmm. to my life um could seem left alone as kind of the narcissistic navel gazing piece and then but we've always said that the subtitle is actually the most important part recognizing and responding to god in my story and putting our story under the umbrella of God's story um, in the mind of heart of, of God we were before we were even conceived and brought to life 
to be in relationship with God. Uh, and then if we're, the, if we're doing that, then it's naturally going to flow. That's going to be for the, mm-hmm. for the, yes. for the benefit of others. And this is our desire yes. is to help people to recognize and respond to God, their stories. That's why we do what we do. Yes. And, um, so if any of that was interesting to any of you listeners, um, I really encourage you to go to the one life maps, uh, home page that's o-n-e-l-i-f-e-m-a-p-s dot com um and we've got a free introduction booklet that you can download um download it read the introduction kick the tires of it you'll also see in the midst of that that there's these listening guidelines that become really core and there are other podcast episodes um, about that listening but that the listening guidelines help us be together in a space of belonging to share our stories in a way that basically help us to not only the listening guidelines are for the listeners um, so that we can create a safe place for someone to speak out their story to be heard by others and but also most importantly to be able to hear ourselves say it and then in the in-between also be listening for God in the midst of it his nudges and his things that he wants us to notice coming out in the cracks of all of that and if it's if it's done well it gives people a way to map their life stories to document them to share them and then to be able to recognize not only what's going on inside of the themselves but what god is trying to say get a word in edgewise as i often say (laughs) and that's what we do that's why we do this is because we want people to be conformed to the image of christ for the benefit of others amen it's what we do it's why we do it and um we're so grateful that you listened sybil i'm so grateful that you brought this uh this piece of teaching that you're going to do tonight to the conversation today Thanks for the preparation work that, that went in to do that. And Joan, thanks for joining mm-hmm. in on that conversation. Great to be with you today. Okay, have a great day. Many blessings, everyone. Bye-bye. Have you thought, I don't know myself anymore? Have you wondered, is there something more? Are you at a crossroads in life and asking, which way will lead me toward expressing more of who I am made to be? Are you looking for a way to understand the restlessness you feel inside? Are you seeking a deeper spiritual life and desire to rediscover who you are through God's eyes? You're ready for the life mapping experience of Listen to My Life. Go to onelifemaps.com to purchase your portfolio of visual life maps. While you're there, check out our upcoming virtual coaching groups, live workshops, and options for you to facilitate the Listen to My Life experience with others. That's onelifemaps.com. O-N-E-L-I-F-E. M-A-P-S dot com.